This is a traditional site for the Garden of Gethsemane. And um, the, the garden that Jesus went to is most likely a private garden that he had access to the night that he came and was betrayed. That final night where he surrendered his will to the will of the Father to go to the cross to take the sins of all the people upon his shoulders. Uh, some of the olive trees in this place literally date back to almost near the time of Christ. There aren't any that old, but on this hill, of course, the, the Garden of Gethsemane, the name, as many of you know, means the, the Garden of the Olive Press. And so it was full of all these olive trees. There were, these were the places where they pressed the olives into the oil. And really, what is that when you think of it? The oil being pressed is when it separates the physical part of the oil, uh, of the olive, from the oil. Literally, you would say that the oil is being poured out unto death, almost, you could say. It's where it is literally being pressed to the point of so much pressure that the oil is released from the flesh of the, of the, of the olive. And so what a, uh, what a picture that paints to us of Jesus uh, when he was here in that, in that night. And so I want to read you that story, but before we do, here's a thought I want you to consider. And I, it, just, it just rings in one word, this garden... Um, it's, it's just overwhelming to me to even think about, um, even today. It's really marked in one word. And it's the word obedience. I want you to think about the significance of the obedience of Christ in this place. This place represents the tipping point of saying yes to God and His will or saying no to God in His will, and what comes as a result of that thing. And I can't help but think that when Jesus was here, He was thinking about, He already knew what was coming. He's told His disciples already what was coming. He knew what was ahead of Him, but He had to come to that place of obedience. Even as the Son of God, the book of Hebrews tells us that though He was a Son, He learned obedience through the things that He suffered. Not because he was tempted to be disobedient, because he had to be the example of what it meant to be obedient in the face of suffering for us. To show us what it means to fully submit our human will to the will of the Father, even if it means suffering ahead of us. You remember what the Bible tells us in Hebrews as well, that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And this was a place where he made that decisive that decisive point of decision to go to the cross. This was where his will was submitted to the will of God. And I think that probably when he was here, he might have been thinking of Samuel's words to Saul. When Saul was disobedient to God in, in, uh, in not wiping out the Amalekites and then bringing back his own, his, all the animals and all the things, doing things his own way. And he, he was making excuses when he was confronted on this, you know. And, and he said, well, I just wanted to bring some sacrifices back so we could sacrifice to the Lord. And Samuel told him this, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. And often we think of the, the sacrifice of Christ being the most important thing, but do you know that the sacrifice of Christ was secondary to his obedience. And when I say that, I don't mean secondary as in less important. What I'm saying is the sacrifice would have never came until and unless the obedience came first. The obedience in this garden when Jesus knelt down and poured out drops of blood in anguish and in pain and in surrender happened as a result. That obedience is what led to his sacrifice. And I want to just say that Jesus was the example of how obedience is obtained and lived out even when obedience results in sacrifice. And so as we think about this, we think about the prophetic word of Psalm chapter 40 that speaks of Jesus. It's also repeated in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. He says this, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. 
burnt offering and sin offering you did not require, then I said, Behold, I come. This is Jesus speaking. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O God, and your law is within my heart. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. The body of Jesus was the sacrifice. But he said, I have come to do your will, O God. That's, what is that? That's obedience. Obedience to the will of God. And so as we think of this place, I want you to consider, well, if you can over the calls of prayer. <laughs> when Jesus came here during the time of Passover, Pastor Josh said it, the population would have swel swelled up here in this place to two and a half million Jews making their pilgrimage from all over Israel to this place. And you know what that meant at the temple? The night that Jesus came here, there were sheep being prepared and being sacrificed that night. 250,000 sheep being sacrificed. And the Kidron Brook, which runs between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives that Jesus would have crossed over, would have literally been a river of blood coming straight from the Temple Mount down into the water, the blood streaming down. And as Jesus and his disciples, I want you to think about it, Jesus is coming to the Mount of Olives and he passes over the brook Kidron and it's just flowing with the blood of the sacrificial lambs. And Jesus knows that he is the ultimate lamb that's going to spill his blood to take away the sins of the, uh, of the world. And so here he comes over to the olive press or to the garden press. And here's the story in Mark chapter 14, verse 32 through 42. It says, And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. So, I want you to think about this. Peter, James, John, come with me to a, a quiet place. What's the last, the last time that Jesus told Peter and James and John to come with him, what happened? They saw him transfigured, transformed, shining like the sun, Elijah, Moses, right? They're probably thinking, part two, like continue, you know, this is going to be the sequel, even better. Like what's going to happen next? This is going to be the, the time when he maybe takes the kingdom, whatever it might be. And they come up here and he says, I'm troubled. I'm deeply distressed. Uh, to the point of death. I mean, I don't know what you guys have faced in your life that has brought you to a point of trouble and distress. Um, but if you think that you don't have a Savior who gets it, you're totally wrong. If you don't think you have a Savior who understands what it's like to be up against the most difficult thing that one could imagine, and I'm not talking simply about the, the pain of his death and the beating and the mocking. I'm talking about him knowing that the sin of the world was about to be placed upon his shoulders as a, as a sacrificial lamb. He knows. He understands. And I think this just needs to be said by way of application. Maybe someone in here really needs to hear this. There is no sin in being distressed. There is no sin in being troubled. There is no sin in being afraid and discouraged about the things that you're facing. But Jesus shows us how to deal with those things, those weights, where to take them, and what happens next. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And there is that, that moment of surrender. Um, the most beautiful statement in, in, in the scripture right there. I mean, he comes to this place, if this cup, and of course the cup can be many things. The cup of God's wrath, uh, the cup of suffering. The cup refers to something that you have to drink, something you have to bear, something you have to take upon yourself. Remember when James and John were asking Jesus to make him like the best positions in the kingdom. Let's well, actually, they got their mom, mom to do it, so, you know, even more. Um, and, he, and he says, hey, are you going to be able to drink, you know, the cup that I'm going to drink? 
And they're thinking, yeah, when you mean when, when we're like sitting on thrones and you're, you're drinking the cup of glory? He says, no, that's the cup of suffering. He says, you will drink it. And so here he says, but notice the, the human part of Jesus. We see his human nature and it's not sinful. <laughs> but he's like, if any other way of salvation is possible, if any other way that, that Josh Blevins and Elizabeth Allen and Chad Young can experience peace with God, and complete forgiveness of all their rebellion and all their sin, is if it's obtainable by sacrifice, by moral performance, by any other means, let this cup pass from me. But he already knows the will of God. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And so here Jesus is surrendering his will for the salvation of all mankind. And what are his disciples doing? He came and found them sleeping. And he said, Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And the third time he said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So Jesus is being pressed, and the disciples are enjoying a rest. Pressed at rest. <laughs> Aren't we grateful that Jesus did what we could not do in this garden. And yet there is a stern and incredible encouragement and exhortation for us in this as well. You know, Jesus one day is, is returning and I, I still think his, his request for us is watch and pray. Be sober. Be vigilant for the adversary, you're the devil, your adversary, roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And when he comes, he wants to see his people not slumbering and sleeping and apathetic and dull, but he wants to see them aware and awake and ready, awaiting his return. And so he gives us this incredible encouragement. And yet for Jesus, he had come to that place of surrender. He had battled the temptation of letting it all go, of moving the other direction. He could have called angels down to save him. He could have, as God, just said, you know, this isn't gonna be, uh, this isn't gonna be my plan. I'm just gonna divert this. But no, he surrendered to the will of the Father. And so when you guys come to these places where you feel like you're being pressed, and, and by the way, if you think God's will is always just leading you into comfort, I have another story to tell you. <laughs> and so does Jesus. But I want to tell you God's will will always lead you into joy. Even if it's through pain. Even if it's, if it's through sacrifice. Even if it's through surrender. Even if it's through the offering of yourself as a living sacrifice on the altar of God's will. There will be joy ahead. It might be the joy you experience in eternity, but there will be joy ahead. And I want to read you the scripture from the book of Philippians that you know well. And he's talking about Jesus. And he says, He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. There is the suffering and there is the glory. There is the cross and there is the crown. And one precedes the other. And he took that for us and he showed us the path of obedience. And 
Uh, Pastor Josh is going to talk about this, but I just wanted to point out one other insight. Because as Jesus was in this garden, and you can't see it here because of the wall, but you'll see it when we go on the Mount of Olives. His back is towards Jerusalem, heading towards the olive press. But as he turns his head back, he looks, and on the the wall of Jerusalem, he sees the eastern gate. The eastern gate is a very important and special gate. In Ezekiel 44, Ezekiel sees a vision of this gate, and notice what he says. Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces east, and it was shut. Now, if you look there today, it's completely sealed, and we'll go into that later. And he said to me, this gate shall remain shut and shall not be opened, and no one shall enter by it, for the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. Jesus entered that gate when he came from the Mount of Olives into the temple. The Lord had passed through it. Therefore, it shall remain shut. Only the prince may sit in it and eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the vestibule of the gate and shall go up by the same way. In in other words, until the Messiah comes, he's the only one who can go through that gate while it's shut, until it's open. But here's what I want to point out to you about this place. When Jesus was here pouring himself out, bleeding drops of blood, sweating drops of blood, praying three times, coming to that place of ultimate surrender. Think about the pole. He looks back and he sees the gates. He says, if I enter those gates, I become the king. If I go this way, I become the suffering servant. And which one did he choose? He chose the way of suffering knowing that one day when he returns in glory, he'll choose the way of glory. And that's going to be an amazing day. And so I think, I don't know how much time we have here, but as we're here, okay, as we're here, what I'd love for you guys to do is enjoy the garden. (laughs) Sit by a tree. Take some time as you think about these words, obedience and surrender. Maybe there's something pulling up in your heart and in your life where you are saying, you know, I need to come to that place where even if I kind of have to argue with God or go back and forth with Him or be real honest with Him about how I feel about what's going on in my life right now or my relationships or this decision I have to make, that maybe I can sit in this place where Jesus sat And come to a place where I literally say from the depths of my heart, Lord, not my will, but yours be done.